Hello and welcome to another episode of Let's Argue About Plants, the podcast for people who love plants. But not always the same ones. I'm Carol Collins. I'm Associate Editor at Fine Gardening. Hey, Carol. I'm Danielle Sherry. I'm the Executive Editor of Fine Gardening Magazine. You guys know us. It's like you invite us into our your houses every single episode. I feel like I should have brought something, a cake, maybe some wine. Actually, definitely some wine because we're recording in the afternoon, which normally we do not. And I'm just like, okay, I'm not feeling it right now. But that's all right because we're going to roll into a really fun topic, which is, what is which, it? Which is uh, deer resistant favorites. And I think, I think it could be any kind of, you know, herbivore. Yeah. Right. Right. Right, Because if a deer doesn't eat it, a a prairie dog certainly isn't right. (laughs) Rabbits. A lot of these are rabbit resistant. (laughs) I immediately went to the prairie dog. I don't know. Um, Yeah. Rabbit resistant. Um, I would even dare to say like woodchuck resistant. Let me tell you, I, I'm looking at my list and a lot of them are toxic. So I me think, too. <laughs> I think uh, it's fair to say that nothing would or would want to eat any of the plants that, that I've chosen. But it's it was shocking to me, Carol, I was looking and I didn't see a single uh, previous deer resistant episode or even anything on that take. Uh, this might be our first time talking about deer resistant plants. That's bananas. It seems it seems that way. And I was looking at back to see if I had talked about any of these plants that I'm going to cover as I thought I must have talked about these before. And I think I think I haven't. So we'll wow. see. <laughs> all right. All right. So but we're, we're setting the bar high for you guys on this Thursday afternoon. <laughs> OK, so let's kick it off. Carol, I did shrubs and perennials. Did you do shrubs and perennials as well? I did. Yes. Okay. Amazing. I also really tried to tap into some plants that are outside of my zonal range because we did get some feedback on the pod. Um, People out West and down South love us. We were at a recent trade show and, but we tend to pick New England plants because we are from New England and we garden in New England, but we do our best to make them as wide a zonal range as possible. Well, I went really outside my box today. Um, how about you? Yeah, uh, yeah. Mine are mostly, yeah, have a very large zonal range as well. So, All right, well, kick us off. Okay. All right. I'm starting with one that I think is kind of surprising because if you saw it, you would think that it was deer candy. So this is one that I've had, I think, about 10 years. It's called Thujopsis dolabrata variegata. So that is variegated Heba arborvitae. Mm. And it is hardy from zones five to eight. This is the native species is from Japan. So this is pretty adaptable. But what it likes is full sun to full shade. So it's very adaptable for light. But if you're in the south or if you're in a place with really hot summers, you're probably going to want to site it where it gets some protection from the afternoon sun. Because this cut is a woodland plant. So it really, you know, really, especially with the white variegation that this has, it might burn. Mm -hmm. So it's Thujopsis, not Thuja. Although it is related to the arborvitaes that we are familiar with, um, this is in its own genus, and it is the only species in its genus. And the straight species is this big, giant conical tree, a little bit hard to use in a home landscape, but variegata is more shrub-like. And so over 10 years, it may get as big as 10 feet tall and wide. Mine has not. Mine is probably only three feet tall and wide. So it stays nice and compact for a long time, which is nice, makes it more useful. It's got that lovely texture that Arborvitae has. So it's got these flat sort of fan-like leaves that almost look... um, like scaly and the variegation is pure white just very beautiful and then on the bottom side it's a little silvery and so if you go in the show notes I I have photo of this and you can see some of the undersides just the way that the the branches arrange themselves and that gives you a little bit more even of the color and for you know whatever reason 
It looks like Arborvitae. It probably smells a little bit like Ar- Arborvitae. <laughs> But the deer leave it alone. And I can tell you, it's not that the deer aren't going into this part of my garden because I planted about 10 feet away from this, the tiger eye sumac, which is supposed to be so very deer resistant. They ate that until it was dead. (laughs) (laughs) And just every time it got a new growth on it, they'd come and eat it off. And meanwhile, walking right by the Thujopsis. So I would say, you know, at least my deer do not are zero interest, zero interest. So if you like the look of Arborvitae, this might be an option for you. The one thing I will say, I have I saw some sources online. It may be a little bit hard to find at your local nursery Um, and the nursery, the local nursery where I bought mine has since gone out of business. Mm -hmm. But it is worth tracking it down. It's a little cool, understated plant great filler i love it i mean i think you know it it probably it falls into the choice conifer you know section where they can be hard you know these these choice kind of you know not rarefied but you know a little bit tougher to find conifers they're worth it they are certainly worth it you know and worth seeking out those specialty nurseries that really focus in on those conifers that you know aren't your standard Eastern or American arborvitae that are basically just deer food. (laughs) So don't plant them. Definitely don't plant them. That's, and I love that it's an evergreen too, right? So that sees, I think it's really, really difficult to find evergreens that the deer do not browse because the pressure is so intense, especially towards the end of winter, which is when we're recording right now. And you know, I'm seeing more and more and more deer in my gardens, more and more deer pressure, and they're just starving. I mean, they start eating things like mountain laurel, which is supposedly toxic to them, or at least a little bit, you know, it should cause some stomach upset. So for something like that, I mean, that's, that's a huge home run, huge home run. Um, I get to do an evergreen perennial, so I'll hop on the evergreen train. All right. And I don't want anybody like laughing when I say this. So I'm going to talk about a hellebore. You, know, you guys, if you've listened to this podcast since podcast day one, and now we're on 55 episodes, you know, I have a love hate relationship with hellebores. Um, I got to say, I'm going to give it up to the plant breeders because hellebores, my big thing about them was that they bloom in the winter and primarily the old school hellebores they looked down and they were buried underneath the foliage. So really you had to like get down on your hands and knees in February and be crawling in your garden to see the blossoms. That to me did not sound fun. I'm not going to do it. Why am I going to do that? The foliage is evergreen and it is really pretty. It's these huge, large palmate leaves that are kind of forked. They're gorgeous. But if I'm waiting for the bloom show to like carry me through February and into March, I'm definitely not crawling on the ground. New breed breeders, you know, have come into the mix. A lot of these flowers now are on the tops of the plants and they face upward. And there's a bunch of them. You guys have heard me talk about solar flares, one of my favorite ones, which is a yellow variety. But today I wanted to talk about childhood sweetheart, which is a cultivar that's new or fairly new. It's newer in the last two years. Bred by Walter's Gardens out in Zeeland, Michigan. So this is a tough old bird. Uh, Zones four to nine. Doesn't get much, much greater of a zonal range than that. And this is a a variety that we're going to be featuring in our new plants article, which is about to hit newsstands. So run out and grab your issue of Fine Gardening. This is our one newsstand issue that comes out a year, every year. And that's issue 217. Childhood Sweetheart is stunning. It has double petals. So it's a double blossomed variety. And it is a yellow variety, but it has burgundy veining all through those yellow petals and a yellow and a, excuse me, burgundy backside to the petal. So for all intents and purposes, this looks like a bicolor butter yellow and dark burgundy garnet colored blossom. And it's stunning. It is absolutely beautiful. It's average size of most hellebores, which is in the 18 to 24 inches tall and wide. They slowly expand hellebores over time. 
they will eventually kind of make this nice evergreen understory. And I just, I thought that this was just an absolutely stunning example of a, a newer hellebore that really you plant for the blossoms, but also for that evergreen foliage and deer do not eat hellebores. Um, they are crunchy. They are stiff. They are, you know, they're not even fun to like get in there and like kind of shake up and prune because they're just like, Ugh. it's just a, it's an awful noise when you go to prune a hellebore. It's like crunch, crunch, crunch. Um, so maybe that's why deer don't like them. I'm not sure there is. I did read that there is a, a tiny bit of toxicity to them. Um, they are not, you know, it's not sheer death if the deer eat them. Darn it. I wish that was the case, but um, yeah, they are a little bit toxic and that is probably why the, the deer mostly avoid them. But um, partial to full shade on hellebores, they're not super picky about their uh, soil conditions, but you definitely want well-drained soil. They will rot if you have them in standing water. So you want, you want to make sure it's well-drained and um, you know, Depending on where you live, hellebores do like a springtime cleanup. So they're going to bloom um, through the winter and into early spring. And then a lot of times the foliage, the evergreen foliage tends to look a little bit tattered when you move into like mid spring or so. Um, and at that point, you know, the blossoms are gone and the showy bracts that are left behind have kind of lost their luster. So I just go in at that point and I do a full on haircut back to the ground and literally it starts pushing kind of burgundy-ish new growth, it seems like the very next day, you know, because the, the the temps have warmed up and it's it's starting to put on growth, new growth very, very quickly. So you don't have an ugly hole in the garden for that long either. So yeah, highly recommend Childhood Sweetheart Hellebore. And please don't write me letters. I know I've come around onto the hellebore train. Carol, do you have hellebores? Do I, are we recording? <laughs> do I? <laughs> yes, of course we're recording. It's live. No, it's not live, folks. We, we, we pre-taped these just in case, you know, I drop some swear words. I think that's what, honestly why we tape ahead. But no, uh, we're recording. Do you have hellebores? Yes. Yes, I do. I got mm -hmm. a bunch. Terra Nova sent us a whole lot of them, but it has been like 13 years, I think, just about. Couldn't be that long. 10 years. So there's, the, yeah, and there's some nice ones mixed in there. I've covered one of them before on the podcast, Berry Swirl or something like that. Um, yeah, and, but they are sort of the old style and you do need to cut them back in order to even see the flowers. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. crawl on your hands and knees underneath. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That I'm out. I'm out for that. <laughs> <laughs> I tell you what, though, I usually do cut mine back in midwinter before they start pushing out new growth. And last year I forgot and they have never flowered better. And it may be, I don't know, maybe those old leaves give them a little extra oomph, but the leaves looked awful. The flowers were amazing. Oh, amazing. Okay. All right. There you go. Well, you heard it here first, folks. This is how you get around the 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 old hellebore pitfall, according to Carol. <laughs> All right. So what do you got? All right. Shrug? So I I, <laughs> I have a it's a very tender annual, which I am finding to be more hardy than is expected. What? And okay, all right. I'm, I'm all right. on board. I all hopped right, on so, the bus. All right. So annual for most of us and maybe kind of perennial. So this one is Victoria Blue Mealy Cup Sage. That's Salvia mm -hmm. Farinacea, Victoria Blue. And it is said to be hardy from zones eight to 10. Mm -hmm. It likes full sun, well-drained soil, just like most of your salvias. Crappy soil is totally fine. Shrugs off heat and humidity. Great summer annual, so good in containers. For some reason, I've been planting this from seed uh, probably for five years now, and it comes back for me. Like, it makes it through mm -hmm. the winter and comes back for me. And we are zone six, like, solidly zone six, not really even close to zone seven um yeah so i don't know what it is may, might be my very very well-drained soil now it's Make, coming back 
the roots or is it seeding itself in kind of its own footprint? The same plants coming back from the, the roots. So the top dies down to the ground. Then in the spring, you get little green new growth and boom, we're back off to the races. It does self-seed a little bit and those seedlings quickly catch up. And then I start some indoors about 12 weeks before our average last frost. And those those take longer to flower than either the ones that are coming back from the roots or the ones that have self-seeded themselves. I've just been sort of adding to my stock each year. I don't think they're particularly long-lived. I think they maybe make it through one winter, maybe two, and then they're done. But um, it's just a very pretty filler plant that goes well with a lot of other things. So unlike a lot of sages, which have a sort of a wrinkly leaf or a gray, fuzzy leaf, this has got smooth, shiny, deep green leaves, a little bit of a serrated edge on them. Uh, It has a beautiful indigo blue flower spikes and not just the flowers or the calyxes, calyxes, are, are that blue color, but also the stem that holds them, which is mm-hmm. called, what is that, a stipe or something? But that, that stem that holds the flowers is also like a beautiful dark blue or almost purple. So that's that's super nice. And, and it looks good with bright colors. It looks good with soft colors. Um, depending what it's with, it sort of has a changeable personality. Um, and of course, like, like again with all the other salvias the deer are completely uninterested it smells bad to them they will not even take a, an exploratory nibble but it's not poisonous and it makes plenty of seeds so i i will collect my own seed at the end of the season if and the photo that i put in the show notes i you can see i don't deadhead so um you can see the flowers and then you can see a spike of that has started to go to seed seeds are pretty, you know, easy to handle and they germinate beautifully. So I put mine into the, into a sort of a nursery flat to get them started, put them on heat four or five days later, they're already starting to emerge. Hmm. So, and for me, that would be in in mid February to get them, you know, the 12 weeks that they need before I can set them out in the ground. Mm -hmm. So they're already going at your house. Yes, yes. Nice, 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 nice. That's awesome. So, and what is the fragrance? Is it like pungent? Does it, does it smell like cat pee? Like, what does it smell like? Because salvias kind of stretch the gamut for scents. Yeah, it's like, you know, the kind of that herbal, if you, if you know hippies that like to smudge. Okay. (laughs) It It smells like that. It just, you know, it smells like sage, but it's not, not what I would call a particularly pleasant smell, but it's not really super offensive and really only notice it if you touch the plant. It isn't like just sitting there, you know, reeking up the place. (laughs) (laughs) It's not expending its scent into the air. Okay. All right. Interesting. I love the fact that deadheading is optional because most of the time, you know, especially with what are typically like annual salvias or the tender perennial salvias, man, they can leave behind some really uggo deadheads um, in their wake. And you're just looking at, you know, kind of these brown fried out tits. So the fact that it's got, you know, a pretty calyx to leave behind and the stem that holds that, that calyx is, that's, that's pretty. That's, that's awesome. That's awesome. The whole thing kind of goes a little silver as it as it ages, which it, it looks just fine. I I don't mind it at all. If you do, it's really easy to take off. That's awesome. And I peeked online, Carol, because uh, we were putting together our show notes. It looks like you've got a couple of different photos of the sage on here at different stages. Oh, that was that was the other perennial. I have oh, two oh, of the okay. other perennial, just oh, one of sorry. this. Sorry, just kidding. Just kidding, everyone. Just but, kidding. <laughs> but in that photo, you can, you can see it, the flower, and then you can see a stem that has kind of gone by, if you will. Okay. So that, you know, you can decide if, if that's something you would want to cut off. But for me, I don't mind them. 
Nice, nice. Well, that's a good one. That was in multi-purpose too, multifunctional, could put in the garden, could put in containers, comes back unexpectedly. I like it. I really do. All right. So, uh, spoiler alert, we were recently in Seattle, as I said at the top of the show, and we were at the Seattle Flower and Garden Festival. And it was great. It was awesome to see all of you guys. We had a few people come up to us and say, I recognize your voice. And I'm like, oh, I'm sorry. (laughs) But uh, it was really, really awesome to talk to people. And as I was wandering around Seattle and doing errands and running here and there and everywhere, mostly looking for, I think, at one point in time, Tylenol, um, I stumbled across this plant that was planted in a traffic circle, which I was just shocked about. And it was winter Daphne. So Daphne Odora, and that's zone seven to nine. And, you know, one thing that struck me immediately was I've always thought of many Daphnes as these precious, precious shrubs, you know, right? They're difficult to get established. They don't like to be moved. They are tricky in colder climates. I have always grown Daphne transatlantica, which tends to be a little hardier. It's hardy, I believe, into zones 5B6. So we can get away with that one. And um, and it's a, it's a little bit tougher of a Daphne. Still fragrant flowers and beautiful. But winter Daphne is just next level. And I thought, oh, you know, the deer don't eat my Daphne at home. Do they eat winter Daphne? Oh, no. No, they do not. They actually are awesome and stay away from it. And that's because Daphne's are toxic. Um, They have toxic properties to them. So winter Daphne in this punishing urban environment was gorgeous. It had these long tongue-like green, dark green leaves that were very, very shiny and kind of rubbery in texture. They were clustered around this very petite three to four foot tall and wide shrub completely surrounding these rubberized, almost cinnamon colory stems, I would call it, on a Daphne. And that's not the main event, though. The main event is it was February, and this thing was putting off a perfumed, beautiful vanilla scent from, you know, half a block away. I was like, huh, what's that? I, I smelled it before I saw it. And got up close and, oh yeah, it was covered in clusters of these whitish pink tubular flowers that kind of, you know, kind of mass themselves together in an almost uh, cotton ball, snowball look and covered the whole top of the plant. Long blooming Daphne's for the most part, regardless of what um, species you pick, are generally blooming for about mm, six to eight weeks. They, they put on a show for a long time. And you know, winter Daphne at a time of year when not much else is going on in the garden, which is amazing. It's an evergreen uh, for for uh, folks in the set in the zone seven to nine range, um, partial to full shade. I would tend to say more par- of partial shade if you want a, a ton of good flowering on it and moist, well-drained soil. Daphne's are another one that they do not like to sit in water. They will rot, they will resent it, and they don't like it. And I think I've already covered the fact of once you plant a Daphne, don't move it because they pout, they are very upset with you. And a lot of times you'll read gobs and gobs and gobs of stories online of people who have actually killed a Daphne simply by transplanting it or attempting to transplant it. Um, But I I just love the fact that this is a, a petite, fragrant, evergreen shrub that will tolerate urban conditions to a certain degree and it's deer proof, which is great. I just really, really love it. Now, if you're not in the, you know, Daphne Odora game because you're outside of zone seven to nine, you know, that is a mild climate. I highly recommend Daphne transatlantica. That's a really great species that's tougher, a bit hardier, uh, semi evergreen, depending on where you are in its range, it will lose some of its leaves, but still gives you that great deer resistant property that we love in Daphne's. All right. So we've had an annual, a perennial, a shrub. Carol, you got a tree? 
<laughs> I have a really big shrub. How about that? Okay, we'll say <laughs> large shrub slash small tree. Okay, <laughs> it's in the eye of the beholder. So what what is that? Okay, so I'm going to go with Eastern Sweet Shrub, which is also known as Carolina Allspice. Mm -hmm. That's Calicanthus floridus and hardy from zones four to nine. This is one that has a big range and it is native to a lot of the Eastern, Eastern United States. You zone four people, you may experience some dieback or winter injuries, but the plant will come back vigorously from the base if you if you have those kind of problems. And so really like pretty adaptable plant. This this is one that likes moist, well-drained soil. It will tolerate alkaline pH. Those of you that need that, you know who you are. A few of the cultivars in this genus um, have been featured in previous episodes, especially Burgundy Spice. Everyone loves Burgundy Spice. It's got the gorgeous Burgundy foliage. Um, I am here to say that the straight species is just absolutely awesome. This is one of the very few excellent plants that were on my property when we bought it about 15 mm -hmm. years ago. So we had like um, this random giant PG hydrangea and we had a thicket of Calicanthus florida, which was sort of um, fighting it out with the burning bush along our Oof. property line. And uh, this thicket was probably at least 20 feet wide and and deep. So, Whoa. you know, yeah, it's it's got a suckering habit. And if you leave it to its own devices, it'll it's not a tree. It's like a, a little forest, uh, <laughs> but very, very lovely. It has these wonderful early early to mid spring blooms that are like a, a fantastic, like deep burgundy color. And they smell like a lot of people try to describe the scent and it's fruity, but I think it's like a cross between strawberries and see, like cedar. Oh, like, yeah. It's like a, almost like a, you know, a conifer smell, but also fruit. Very pretty, very uh, attractive to early pollinators. And then the foliage, nice, big sort of heart shaped, shaped foliage. The bark is very beautiful. It's it's a, a nice warm cinnamon colored bark on those on the multiple stems. And if you break a stem, it has a spicy like sort of between camphor and allspice. And you know, that gives it its name, Carolina Allspice. Big and vigorous. It gets like 72 feet two inches tall and wide, according to to the Chicago Botanic Garden trial. Um, I'm, you know, I can tell you it gets bigger than that <laughs> eventually. But what I did, what happened for us in the, in the place where it was growing was that the town or our neighborhood needed to do drainage work. So I lost that whole hedgerow. They just like the, they came, they cut it to the ground. Before mm -hmm. that happened, I dug out a couple of suckers and I moved them over to the other side of our property. And it took, you know, four or five years, but they they came back. They're now full sized. Um, and now I'm giving suckers away to other people who would like to try growing this plant. Um, I don't know. I, I, I really like this. And I think that the straight species in particular, you know, you can have your Hartledge wine there, you know, the, the, the cultivars are amazing, but I just, I just think this is really worth growing the straight species. And again, the deer have never shown even the slightest bit of interest, maybe because of that camphory smell. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, I, um, I know you worked with Richard Hart, uh, um, hockey on the Calicanthus article. I was blessed enough that I got to go out and photograph it. So I got the good end of the stick on that article. And that trial was so beautiful to see. I was out there for when they were basically on their way out of bloom, but uh, just so impressive. Dark burgundy flowers. A lot of the cultivars have uh, white flowers. Venus is one that struck out to me that was just 
massive. Like from afar, the blossoms were so big that I thought it was a magnolia. It was that beautiful. Um, and uh, something that I had picked up on in Richard's article that I got to see in person is that the seed heads are really cool, are really attractive and interesting on the straight species and all the different cultivars too. So that was just an added bonus for that. Um, I it was it was a photo shoot that I didn't think was going to be all that exciting, and it ended up being super exciting. <laughs> so thanks for sending me to Chicago, Carol. I liked it. It was fun. It was fun. Um, okay, I. The first plant that actually popped to mind um, after hellebores for me was euphorbias. I think, uh, you know, I've got several different kinds of euphorbias. They don't do awesome here in the Northeast, um, I think because we get too much water. And unless they're in a, you know, we have a really wet winter, typically, not really this year, but <laughs> um, we typically, you know, snow cover, that sort of thing. Euphorbias really resent um winter wet, they tend to rot out. Um, but in areas of really well drained soil, which I do have some hilly areas of that and full sun, they'll do pretty well. And one that I have that I just love, and I feel like it's old hat at this point, most people know about is bonfire euphorbia, which is euphorbia polychroma bonfire zones five to nine. So this isn't one of those euphorbias that, you know, um, only California can grow. It's a really, really hardy euphorbia. The other thing that just to know about the species euphorbia, if you don't already, is if you have crappy soil, lean, not amended, poor, acidic, maybe a little like high in, in acidity, it does really well. It's a, it's a plant that really thrives in those really crappy situations. So the thing that also makes them great is that they are deer proof, man, bomb proof and deer proof. Um, no critters tend to eat this. Even my army of voles stay away from my euphorbias. And that is probably because it produces a milky sap that has some toxicity to it. So, you know, be warned that when you have to, you know, go in and do spring cleanup or do any sort of trimming back on euphorbias, you definitely want to wear gloves because it has that milky sap that can cause some skin irritation and apparently is not awesome to the stomach lining of a deer because they, they avoid it. I love bonfire because it acts like a little sub shrub. It's uh, these small leaves that are almost almond sized and almond shaped that are up and down the, the shrub and very, very fine texture to this particular euphorbia. The top growth is a combo of this like dark purple, red, orange, really ends up looking like a bonfire, you know, like that moment when you put the log on the bonfire and all the different various colors of flames throw up. So that eventually transitions to green towards the inside and the interior of this smaller shrub, I will call it, even though it is a perennial. It's about 18 inches tall and about 36 inches wide. So you kind of get an idea. It's kind of like a flattened mound. In fall, which is amazing. If you live in a zone where you get some cooler temperatures on those fall nights, this plant erupts into a pure fire red. It gets a really, really nice fall color to it. In cooler areas of its of its zonal range, I would say probably in zones five and six, this is going to drop most of its leaves, stay somewhat semi-evergreen, I guess you would consider that. In the warmer zone seven, eight, nine, this is going to be an evergreen for you. So you might need to, you know, trim out some of those tattered leaves on the backside of, of the winter months. Um, I also forgot to mention it flowers. I mean, as if it's not putting on enough color in all these other areas. In spring, it gets these sulfur red bracts. It's not really flowers. The flowers are these little insignificant, teeny tiny microscopic things. But what you really notice are the bracts that are awesome, awesome acid yellow. And against that darker, deep red foliage, it's just like, woo, eye catching. Um, so, you know, euphorbias in general, great, great genus if you're looking for deer proof plants. But in particular, I really like bonfire. I think it puts on quite the little color show all season long. All right, Carol, bring it on home. Bring it on home. 
Okay, so this is the plant that has two looks. <laughs> two, and the, like. two looks, two looks, two photos in the show notes. Gerald Darby Iris. Oh, uh -huh. oh, I love this one. This is Iris Robusta or Robusta, I'm not sure. Gerald Darby is the cultivar. It is hardy from zones four to nine, huge range on this one. Robusta is a hybrid of two North American iris species, and there are multiples of this of this cross from this cross. That's Iris versicolor and Iris virginica. Mm -hmm. And the Gerald Darby gets two to three feet tall and about one and a half to two and a half feet wide. So it's a little narrower in its habit. And it has the nice strappy upright foliage that you would expect from an iris full sun average to wet soil. So if you've got a spot that doesn't dry out, it can, this can grow in up to four inches of water. It's good oh, for yeah. if you're doing, you know, around the perimeter of a water feature or something like that, really just, it looks very natural as like a wetland plant. If you, if you're going for that effect, it's got lovely blue violet flowers, late spring to early summer. And these are just like what you would expect if you went to the florist and you were buying iris with that like beautiful indigo blue color mm -hmm. and the you know distinct iris shape. But the main attraction of this iris is the foliage. When it first emerges, it's the you know, like the glaucous iris foliage but it's it's streaked in royal purple it's just like mm -hmm. someone took a brush of purple paint and brushed up from the bottom and it's just it's such a it's it's at a time of year when you've got you know spring flowering bulbs are happening but really not a lot else and it's so unexpected it's so cool and that color will fade over time. And by the time the flowers emerge, you really don't see it anymore. But the stems of the flowers are also have that purple color. So there's, you know, you, of course, you get plenty of color from the flowers, but you got color for at least a month before that. I had this in a spot where really it was just, you didn't see it very much. So it, it's around the corner of the house, it's sort of the path between the vegetable garden and the house. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't getting, a, you know, as much sun as it probably should, but it, it, it didn't care. It's very tough. And it had, it had increased, increased in size over time. So this year I divided it and I moved it out near the road so that people can see it and enjoy it and because I felt like I was the only one that ever noticed <laughs> Gerald Darby and poor Gerald Darby he likes to be noticed <laughs> he's flashy he, he likes is. the flash yeah yeah this is a plant with personality for sure um one word of caution when you are dividing this plant it is toxic especially the rhizomes you should wear gloves when you're dividing it um to to avoid exposing yourself to the toxins but again that keeps the bunny rabbits and the deer away so we do not mind and really you know you i have to wear gloves anyway when i'm gardening yeah. right so yeah. You know, it's not, but just, you know, just to be aware, it's like, don't be breaking up the rhizomes and rubbing your eyes. So, like, <laughs> don't, that, try, don't try to, don't try to eat them. Don't rub right. them all over your face. <laughs> <laughs> Throw them down and roll around. And again, yeah, you, you guys get the point. <laughs> I love it. But yeah, just a, an excellent all around plant and uh, two photos in the show notes. One of Gerald Darby's beautiful legs and one of Gerald his Darby. Gerald Darby. I imagine he is a Southern gentleman. He he sounds it. He definitely sounds it with a like a very, very beautiful purple ascot. Oh, <laughs> love it. Love it. Yeah, I that is a um that is a plant that I feel like was in my garden. And then it wasn't in my garden. And I don't know what happened to it, but my inclination is, is that it, it too dry. You know, I, I, most of my garden is very dry, very well drained, very 
poor, poor, poor soil. And I think over time, of course, also, it could have just been, you know, operator error. And I accidentally planted over top of it at one point in time. But that was a that was a pass along plant that I had received a piece of from someone when I first moved into my garden or into this property years and years ago. And now that you're talking about it, like, I really miss it. I really miss it. I think I need to get I need to get into that game again. Well, ironically, I'm going to talk about a blue flowering shrub to end the show or to end at least our portion of the show today. And I couldn't stay away from talking about a Caryopteris because, I mean, you guys know my affinity for Caryopteris. I feel like I've got like one Zeitis when it comes to this genus. I've got so many different various Caryopteris, but this particular one is Caryopteris incana Jason is the cult of our name, but it's marketed as Sunshine Blue, which is such an appropriate name for it. Caryopteris incana or incana uh, is zones five to nine. So this is one of the hardiest species in the Caryopteris family. I know we've talked about Caryopteris before that a lot of them fall into the zone six and seven zonal range as far as coolness is concerned. This is much hardier, much hardier plant. And I mean, we either talked about today, the plants either fall into one of two categories, right? Somewhat toxic or uber stinky. Um, And this is an uber stinky one. The foliage of Caryopteris is very pungent. It's along the same lines as a Russian sage. It kind of has that, mm, it just, I, I don't, have a really good word for it other than pungent. It's not, it's not skunky pungent. It's just sharp, a very sharp, almost citrusy smell to the foliage, which I actually rather like. I think it's a really nice, sharp smell and it's a deciduous shrub. But the thing about this sunshine blue is that it's leaves are acidic yellow when they first start to push new growth in spring, which is really unbelievable. The leaves look like little itty bitty oak tree leaves. That's the best way that I can explain the shape of them, you know, kind of a serrated edge, but definitely forked in somewhat of a way. Teeny tiny foliage, but then it covers the sticky shrub, the the uh, deciduous shrub in mid-spring, and that foliage eventually only fades out to a chartreuse color. So it really does hold that yellowy tone to it. You want to put this in full sun in order to realize that, that amazing yellowy color. Uh, loose, gravelly, well-drained soil doesn't mind if the soil is lean and drought tolerant once it's established. But the main event, like with most Caryopteris, is when it pushes bloom in late summer and all the way through fall. And there are these gorgeous blue, dark blue on this particular variety, spidery flowers. They're gorgeous. They're so, so, so pretty. The pollinators go bananas. Now, I know, Carol, you had talked about a Caryopteris a few shows ago where one of the main events that you had talked about with this shrub was the fact that this is really offering the pollinators, you know, a last meal on their on their way into hibernation mode or on their migration pathway because it really does bloom, especially here in New England, into sometimes October. I'm going outside giving candy to the trick-or-treaters and this Jason Sunshine Blue, whatever you want to call it, Caryopteris, is in bloom when I'm giving out candy. I already talked about that it's one of the last things to bloom in my garden, but the deer avoid it, which is great. And it's because of that stinky foliage. It's it's a sticky woody shrub too, so I can't imagine it would taste all that that good if you started eating on it. And it doesn't have these teeny tiny little leaves aren't going to be all that luscious to, to munch on anyway. So I feel like if you're in a cooler zone and a cooler zone with a lot of deer pressure, this is a good two to three foot tall and wide shrub that'll really make you, but not the deer, happy. And now, because everything sounds better with a British accent, here's Peter with a poem about all the funny names that gardeners give to deer and the not so funny things they do to our gardens. An Ode to the Gardener's Perseverance. 
In gardens green, where blossoms bloom, gardeners toil with joy and bloom. For in the midst of petals fair, roams a creature beyond compare. The deer, a wily, hungry sprite, with names that tickle in the night. The gardener's lexicon, so sly, describes their foe with a twinkle in the eye. O Bambi's kin, the verdant thief, with munching jaws that cause much grief. Whiskered foragers with antlered grace, through tulips and roses, they make a trace. The gardener's chorus begins to sing, a comical symphony of what they bring. Doe-eyed devils with a graceful prance, or flower fiends who ruin the dance. Antler grazers in the moonlit hour, feast upon the gardener's floral bower. They're nibbling, a comedy, a nightly jest, living chaos in their peaceful quest. Floral felons with a taste so fine, dine on daisies and columbine. But gardeners, resilient in their craft, meet each challenge with a hearty laugh. Rose ransackers on a midnight spree, steal the bloom, causing woe and glee. Yet in the humour of the gardener's law, sprouts determination to restore. With petal plunderers on the prowl, the gardener's heart remains uncowed. For laughter, a shield against the strife, in the dance of nature, the gardeners find life. So in the garden's whimsical play, deer and gardeners share the day. With names so funny, they dance and spar in this tale of gardens, both near and far. You know, just when I think I've heard it all from Peter, he comes up with that. <laughs> yes. Yes, amazing, amazing poetry, beautiful. Amazing. Peter is clearly retired and has a lot more time on his hands recently. (laughs) I am wiping a little tear from my eye. (laughs) Peter, you've elicited a tear out of Carol. Well, uh, hopefully our expert isn't crying at this point. And let's see what she has to say about deer-resistant plants on an opposite coast from us. Hi there, I'm Karen Chapman. I'm a landscape designer and owner of the Jardinet based near Seattle, Washington. And like you, I share my garden with deer. In fact, it was my frustration with those deer that led me to write my book, Deer Resistant Design, as I figured out how to distract attention away from occasional damage and which plants were the most resilient. Choosing flowering shrubs that also offer interesting or colorful foliage is a solid design trick. If we rely on flowers alone and the deer eat them up, well, at least we've still got some colour on the leaves. For that reason, amongst others, Wajila are one of my top deer-resistant shrubs. Varieties of these deciduous shrubs are available with leaves in green, gold, dark purple, or variegated options. And the flowers range from white and pale pink to hot pink and crimson red. You'll find varieties up to six feet tall for the back of the border, and several more compact forms that will fit nicely into small spaces. Wajila are reliably deer resistant. I've never seen any damage on any of mine in over 15 years. They're also drought tolerant once established and pruning is rarely needed, making these the ultimate high performing, low maintenance shrub with three seasons of interest. Magical Fantasy is one of my favourite varieties with crisp green and white variegated leaves that take on a rosy hue in fall and tubular soft pink flowers that hummingbirds enjoy. In my experience, this grows five to six feet tall and four to five feet wide, despite the tags saying they stay much smaller. This needs full sun to look its best. I like to combine this with purple foliage such as a smoke bush for a subtle colour echo with the Wajila flowers and full foliage. The addition of burgundy tipped Shenandoah switchgrass to one side and a low mound of periwinkle blue rosanne geranium completes the vignette. Incidentally, while all these plants have a good level of deer resistance, you may need to use a repellent on the geranium if this is planted right alongside the root that the deer prefer to take through your garden. In my experience, they may stop to browse briefly if it's convenient, but never seem to go out of the way to find it, nor do they ever chew it right down to the crown. Talking of foliage, my second pick is my number one perennial of all time, and it's all about the foliage for me, even though it does have blue flowers in spring. Arkansas Blue Star, or Amsonia hubrichtii, needs to be planted in large drifts. 
I have one bed filled with over 50 of these, but honestly, groups of five or more would be just fine. The feathery foliage emerges a fresh spring green, a lovely foil to the starry blue flowers. Reaching three feet tall and wide by midsummer, these delicate stems move in the breeze and are undaunted by deer, rabbits or lack of regular water. The main excitement occurs in fall, however, when the finely textured foliage turns a kaleidoscope of gold, orange, burgundy and even purple. It's truly spectacular and something I look forward to every year. In late fall, I simply cut off the stems at the base. Now, although Arkansas Blue Star can stand alone in the garden, I enjoy adding a carpet of silver licorice plant or helichrysum. The combination of silver and gold is unexpected in the fall garden. And while the two plants have a very similar texture, the contrast in colour and form keeps this simple duo exciting. In my garden, licorice plant is an inexpensive annual that is reliably deer resistant, rabbit resistant and drought tolerant, a fabulous seasonal ground cover. In warmer climates than mine, it will be perennial. Another full star in my deer resistant garden is the old fashioned black eyed Susan. Gold stem is a variety I use, and once again, I always plant it in large numbers. Deer browsing either never occurs or is negligible. Rabbits, though, can be a nuisance in early spring, but even they can't keep up with this perennial's vigorous growth, and they eventually just give up. Since it blooms so late in summer, there's no benefit to removing the spent flowers, so I leave the seed heads on for the birds to enjoy at least until our relentless winter rains turn them into a sad, soggy mush. I surround my paper bark maple tree with these, the cinnamon peeling bark repeating the colour of the central daisy cone. When the perennial gets cut back in winter, the tree bark is fully revealed, a much better design choice than obscuring the trunk with evergreens or shrubs. Goldstone partners well with grasses, crocosmia and Russian sage. Just be sure to plant it where you can also enjoy the display from inside your home. My final selection is Gora, another perennial, but it's what we call a semi-woody perennial. That means it retains a twiggy structure over the winter, even though it loses its leaves. In colder climate, it's important to leave at least 12 inches of these birth stems in place over the winter, as they protect the crown in the event of a hard freeze. In spring, when danger of frost has passed, cut back the stems to the uppermost leaf buds or to the crown if you want to manage the ultimate size. The variety I prefer is called Whirling Butterflies. It's the most cold hardy variety I've found and it's happy in my average garden soil without supplemental water. In full sun, Whirling Butterflies will reach four to five feet tall and three feet wide by midsummer with a rather lax habit, so it's best not to plant this right next to your path. Slender stems arise from the basal foliage and sway gently in the breeze. These stems are studded with an abundance of white flowers suffused with pink on the reverse, resembling a swarm of tiny butterflies, hence the name. The overall effect is a gauzy, billowing veil, both romantic and ethereal. I can't imagine a sunny garden without them, and the fact that they're extremely deer resistant is just a bonus. Be warned though, if you are one of those super neat gardeners, you may not like the look in winter of those short dead stems. To me, it's a small price to pay for the long summer display. Combine Gora with lavender or sage, perhaps edging with a low growing plant such as silver mound artemisia. The common name for Artemisia is wormwood, but that sounds awful. Silver Mound has stunning felted silver leaves and it's the perfect picture frame for the floral display. I hope that gives you some ideas, not just of deer resistant plants, but of ways to combine them in your garden to really extend the color and season of interest. Have fun. Well, I love it when we can tie in a podcast that to a recent article in Fine Gardening. And as a Karen Chapman just mentioned, she has an article in the most recent issue that's out on newsstands and in mailboxes right now on deer resistant plants. 
and and she's on the other coast so it's not just our deer that these that are these plants are resisting <laughs> <laughs> yeah she yeah it's, it's it's and many 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 more options if you click through and see the article too absolutely absolutely so between the podcast the article and what what else could you possibly want? That's like 54 deer resistant plants. All right, we, we over delivered on this episode, Carol. I'll see you next time.